While national reporters will often swoop in and cover a local story once it's reached national significance, local reporters are there from the beginning. They know the players and they know the communities. Today's guest knows Portland, Oregon as well as anybody, and she's been covering the protests and the violence there from the beginning. She's Noelle Crombie this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me as he does every week is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, storytellers, journalists, novelists, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. This week we're joined by award-winning investigative journalist, Noel Crombie, from the Oregonian in Portland, Oregon. Noel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So, you know, uh, I think uh, we're taping this now at the end of July. Uh, in the last several weeks, uh, the public's attention has been focused on events in Portland, but the story in Portland goes back uh, more than a month, a couple of months now. Tell us what's going on in Portland. Yeah, on Sunday, we had our 60th consecutive day of protests in downtown Portland. Uh, these uh, demonstrations began in the immediate aftermath of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis at the hands of police. And Portland, Portland police have had uh, their own um, issues with um, the killing of, of black Oregonians. And I think the killing of, of, uh, of Mr. Floyd brought those again to the, to the fore. Uh, and really animated protests that we've seen here. They started out um, with uh, thousands of Oregonians gathering on the um, east side of the Willamette River um, and then marching across one of the city's iconic bridges into the downtown core uh, and demanding reforms, uh, of police reforms. Were these, uh, these, these initial protests in the immediate aftermath of, of Mr. Floyd's murder, were they would you characterize them as peaceful? Were they were they violent protests? How would you characterize them? They were peaceful. They were they were largely peaceful. Um, and I was out there covering them along with my colleagues. Uh, and what we saw were uh, was really a groundswell of people showing up and making themselves heard. We saw a lot of young people of color on the front lines of these uh, demonstrations of these marches, uh, leading them and and giving speech speeches at the waterfront. Uh, in front of thousands of people who'd gathered there. Uh, we, I had heard, my, personally, I heard calls from those speakers for uh, peaceful uh, events. However, uh, even early on, we saw spasms of violence um, toward the end of the night um, at, at these events. And that has come to mark these demonstrations uh, straight through to last night. So what is the source of the violence or who is perpetrating the violence? Do you have a sense of that? I'm guessing it isn't any uh, monolithic description here, but who are the perpetrators as best you know? And what are they doing specifically in terms of violence? Well, police have characterized uh, the, um, uh, the violent aspect of these uh, demonstrations as uh, being carried out by agitators, a uh, criminal element, um, what we know is that it's a relatively small uh, group among this larger group. Um, and, you know, as to who they are, uh, you know, we don't have a very clear sense of that. Portland uh, is home to a has robust protest culture um, that predates these events of the past 60 days. Um, we've had a, the sort of far right and far left wing groups sort of doing street brawls here um, in the past few years. We've seen um, uh, you know, large Occupy demonstrations, Mayday demonstrations. 
Um, so the city has seen these large scale uh, signs of sort of unrest uh, in the, over the years. This, it is hard to say, isolate who's carrying out the acts of violence. What we do know is that each night is ending with um, sort of fireworks being thrown at the U.S. District Courthouse uh, in the center of downtown, uh, fires at the being set in the portico of this building, uh, lasers being shown at the um, in the direction of law enforcement, um, and just sort of a, a, a aggressive stance by some demonstrators. And that is met by um, with force by law enforcement. So t talk a little bit about the protest culture in Portland. For those of us who don't live there, I think that might be uh, maybe not necessarily a surprise, but help us understand why Portland, Oregon would become a place where protests left, right, and whatever would, would take yeah. root. Yeah, I mean, that is a complicated, uh, unique to Portland um, situation. Uh, what, what we're seeing on the streets right now are, are clearly a, a large number of Black Lives Matter uh, activists and their supporters. Um, and we're seeing also uh, civil libertarian um, activists. We're seeing people who are against uh, Trump. They're coming out against Trump and federal overreach. But we also have uh, a culture of um, Antifa here, um, you know, uh, anti-fascist activists who um, are play, have a robust role in the city's protest culture. Um, we also have um, anarchists as well who are kind of regulars on that scene as to whether those are the groups or factions that are driving the sort of late night um, disturbances, hard to say. And, and there's not really, there, there is an over, overreaching message of uh, against police brutality and police reform, that is clear. But at the moment that message has, as some have told me, has been sort of co-opted by, um, by, the, by the focus on the federal involvement here. So let's talk for a moment about the the federal involvement. When uh, you know President Trump famously signed his executive order uh, to protect federal buildings and federal monuments, uh, is that the moment when uh, federal police, federal law enforcement became involved in the protests in Portland? There was a turning point. It's a very clear turning point about two weeks ago when. So, so this would be again. We're taping this at the end of July, so that would be mid mid July that there was a turning point. That's right, and it was a it really a watershed moment here where uh, federal uh, officials, law enforcement officials, made up of Department of Homeland Security and um, U.S. Marshal Service uh, 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 deputies um, were uh, one of them fired on a 26 year old Portland man who had his arms, video has shown him to have his arms over his head at the time. Uh, he was holding a boom box. Uh, it was playing a song whose themes were around um, you know, equity and, and, and racial justice. And he did nothing according to the, the, the videos that we have seen that have been widely circulated. Uh, he was doing nothing that was physically aggressive or, or particularly provocative. Uh, he, the video shows that um, this gentleman, Donovan Labella, was uh, fired on in the head. He was hit in the face with an impact munition. Uh, he crumpled to the ground. He continues to experience, um, you know, the effect of a pretty severe brain injury as a result. He was uh, expected to be released from the hospital over the weekend. This inflamed uh, the public and it really animated um, these protests. Up until then, I'd say we had seen a, a dwindling uh, presence out there. Still nightly, uh, still a nightly demonstration, uh, but nowhere near what we saw in the early days. After Ms. Lavella was was fired upon, uh, and the president uh, praised, um, generally offered praise to uh, federal law enforcement's um, response to Portland, and he did that maybe within 48 hours. That that really. Um, elevated, it escalated what we're seeing on the streets. We saw thousands of people come into the streets. Now, people who, while perhaps were, or were, were most certainly sympathetic to Black Lives Matter and the message, message around police reform, they're now animated by uh, resistance to Trump and to, um, and to, the federal, uh, to the federal government's presence on the city streets. 
So what are some of the other tactics that you and your colleagues have observed and written about in terms of federal law enforcement? I know you've done some video, your colleagues have, I've, I've watched some of that. What else, what else has happened? What else are they doing besides, well, obviously tear gas is involved, I guess pepper spray, but let's hear it from you. Yeah, I mean, tear gas is a nightly, is, this is, this is essentially been a nightly ritual. These events unfold almost on a script. So we've got a peaceful start to the evening, speakers, moms uh, who have formed a wall out there, veterans are now uh, their own sort of block of protests. Uh, there are, um, you know, calls for nonviolence and for Black Lives Matter. At some point in the evening, inevitably things will shift, the tone shifts. Um, it's, fireworks are set at the fire at the uh, at the uh, justice center or or at the uh, federal courthouse, um, and police will emerge from the courthouse, and there is just a cloud of tear gas that's emerged. Uh, it, it it coats the downtown core. Um, it's hard to see. It's a cloud of gas that gets uh, released night after night. We're seeing that. Uh, they also use impact munitions of various sorts. Uh, we still don't know exactly what uh, with what Donovan Labella was struck with. Uh, there has been estimates that it was a, uh, or guesses that it was a beanbag round. Others have said it was um, a sponge tip munition. Um, colleagues have been hit with uh, pepper pepper balls. Um, a colleague of mine was struck over the weekend uh, in the back with a um, with an impact munition as well. So if, if you could speak to the average, quote unquote, average resident of Portland or even Oregon who may not be participating in this, what is their reaction to watching all this? I mean, obviously more people are watching and reading about this than actually participating. Do you have any sense of, you know, the Vox Populi? You know, I think people are uh, are deeply unsettled by what's unfolding downtown every night. And to be clear, I, I think, and this is the question I've gotten from my own uh, relatives uh, and friends in New England. Um, it, it, to be clear, this is only taking place in a in a very small part of the downtown core. This is in front of the Mark O. Hatfield U.S. District Courthouse and the Justice Center, which is next door. The Justice Center houses the police bureau and the jail for the county. Uh, these are the two, these are the buildings where this unfolds every night. You could walk a block away from them with your back turned and see a quiet, peaceful street. When I drive home at, after covering these, these events, the city streets are empty and deserted. It looks like, you know, the middle of the night in any other city. Uh, so, uh, so there's that to be aware of. This is uh, really happening in a very small part of our downtown, but I think it's unsettling to most people. Um, and I think there's a sense that perhaps the uh, attention on the federal government's involvement here has taken away uh, or overshadowed the, the message of uh, reforming uh, police. I want to ask you to elaborate on that because you had a really beautifully reported story uh, uh, recently in the Oregonian uh, that was reporting on the the sense that uh, this new phase in the protest is really overshadowing the Black Lives Matter movement. And you quote a speaker from uh, one of the events, uh, a, a Mr. Michael Richard, who said, and I'm quoting here, what's going on over there is a white movement that's taking over Black Lives Matter. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I, um, I was covering the protests over the, during last week, and um, there were probably 2,000 people standing in front of the Justice Center, and uh, the speakers were uh, had spent hours, multiple speakers, um, um, all of them young people of color, addressing the crowd uh, with this message of defunding police and Black Lives Matter. And then it was a very clear moment that sort of Act one was coming to a close because next door at the courthouse, uh, fireworks were being set. And that was a message for people to put on gas masks um, and to um, you know, be prepared for the law enforcement response. And for some, for some of the people that I've spoken with, uh, this is that, 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 that's the narrative that will emerge from that night's protest. It will be drowned out. Uh, the, the message of, of reforming police will end up being uh, drown out, or or at least the, the attention diverted 
from, uh, from reforming the Portland Police Bureau, and it will now be focused on, on Donald Trump and his administration and the actions of federal agents in the streets. And I think it's a frustration uh, for some of the, the activists that I've spoken with. Uh, they are eager to get back to, the, to that original message and to really stay focused on that message um, and to hold uh, city um, leaders and state lawmakers accountable for, um, for the, the demands, for executing the demands that these groups have, have made. And those, so, and those demands include, you know, uh, re reforming uh, police discipline, uh, cutting police budgets for the Portland police at least, um, and eliminating units uh, like the school resource uh, program or transit police or, or the gang, the uh, gun violence reduction team groups that uh, units uh, that uh, some say have, have had a, a disproportionate uh, effect on the on people of color in Portland. So these are significant issues and demands. Is there any progress toward realizing those in Portland? The legitimate okay. demands of, of the Black Lives Matter and, and the, the police protesters. You know, again, you mentioned that in some senses this has been overshadowed by the violence, but there's a real core issue here that is a fundamental issue. Where where does that stand in terms of actually affecting you know, the political change or the police change or both that is needed here. I think it speaks to the, um, the, the, the impact of the demonstrations that amid a pandemic, uh, the governor called for a special session to address issues of, of police reform. Um, so that session is, is underway. Um, and some of the reforms that have been debated and discussed and pushed for are, are now being talked about by lawmakers. Um, we saw a, a very immediate response to the demonstrations in terms of leadership. The, um, the police chief, who was a white woman, uh, she stepped down and made room for um, an African-American successor who was a veteran of the police bureau. Uh, the district attorney also stepped down uh, much earlier than planned uh, to make room for his reform-minded successor. Um, and so you did see a swift response, uh, but and you did see cuts to the police bureau. The, the city council did impose some cuts. Activists say it wasn't enough. They want to see the police bureau you know, fundamentally reshaped and reformed. The mayor has said he does not support defunding and, and eliminating the police department. Uh, so there are still things that are uh, you know that are in play. But I would I would say they've had a, a pretty profound immediate effect. So you are one of America's leading investigative reporters, and, and we're going to get into a little of your work. We don't have enough time to get into all of it toward the end here, I hope. But recently, you've been covering this. What is happening politically, what's happening on the ground, what's happening with the protests. How has that been for you in terms of, A, your, your work and the work that is your passion, not that this is in the passion, but also, you know, in terms of home life and in terms of the stress, this is a very stressful environment, a work environment. You've got young children. How are you managing all of that? I think it's a good question, and it's a, 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 um, a balance that my colleagues and I have struggled with in recent months. It was all hands on deck for the pandemic. And now it's it's sort of all hands on deck uh, for these demonstrations. And um, you know, my daughters see me go out to cover these uh, protests at night with a lot of gear, which includes you know a gas mask. And I came home the other night very very late, and my youngest daughter was still waiting up uh, for me in the very early hours of the morning because she was concerned. You know, it's uh, this dominates the news cycle here. It is uh, really topic A among Portlanders. It is hard to get away from, even though I could, went on a long walk in my neighborhood today and it's a very peaceful and beautiful city. Um, but it, it definitely is the story that uh, journalists need to be bringing. Uh, their focus and their skills and and uh, and their attention to uh, there is no bigger story right now and honestly it's a privilege to be uh, working on it. Well, this is this is public service journalism of the highest order, you know, and you folks are doing it out there and people around the country are doing it. And so you know, great kudos to everyone who is doing that. There, there's no more important time for public service, Amen. Field journalism than now. 
Amen. I, and and I think the, the the broader struggle is news organizations themselves are struggling with resources and uh, you know the the economic forces that um, have played out and devastated uh, news organizations around the country and uh, you know the Oregonian is is no exception to the struggles that the industry has faced uh, and yet um, you know a lot of us have not taken time off and are working really long hours. And uh, so it's uh, sort of a vocation or calling, uh, I guess. Hey, Noel, I'm I'm curious. There's there's a lot of uh, rumor, uh, misinformation, and disinformation about who some of the players are in Portland. And one of the things that has been making the rounds in social media, anyways, is speculation. And I'm going to call it that and see if you can either pin it down or say, yeah, we don't know. Uh, but speculation that the federal forces in camouflage that are emerging from the federal buildings at night uh, 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 you know all kevlared up uh, looking like they are uh, ready for business uh, are really uh, contractors from uh, military uh, contracting companies um, uh, some people might more less generously call them mercenaries uh, if any evidence that what you're seeing in the street is is contracted employees of, of uh, federal law enforcement you know, I've seen that rumor myself, and I don't know um, the extent to which uh, it is a true or not. Um, I do know that the the people who are on the streets uh, representing the federal government are, are also made up of marshal service workers, some of them based here in Portland. Um, so the extent to which there are contractors or, as you say, mercenaries, I, I really, I really don't know. And I and I think that um, you know it's obviously something that needs to be reported, but I, I I can't I can't say whether that's the case. So let's segue here in the few minutes we have left to some of your earlier work. Uh, tell us about Ghosts of Highway Twenty, one of your award-winning uh, series, and also uh, led to a documentary. So talk about that. What was that for those of us who may not know what the Ghosts was? Gosh, and just thinking about that, it feels like it was many lifetimes ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was less than two years ago, no, right? No, no. <laughs> um, uh, the Ghost of Highway Twenty was a um, it was a five part uh, narrative that had a five part documentary component, and it was an examination of uh, one man's. Um, uh, you know, criminal uh, exploits um, in the Pacific Northwest on uh, US 20. Um, he is, uh, he had, he was linked to crimes that had never really been explored or reported very deeply. Um, and so I set about over the course of two years to examine more closely uh, what links he had to the disappearance and assault and killings of, of young women along this sort of very wooded, isolated part of, of Oregon that winds from central Oregon to the to the coast. Um, and in the course of, of that reporting, um, I was able to find um, a young woman who had been raped by uh, this uh, killer. His name was John Aykroyd. He was a state highway mechanic for the Department of Transportation. And uh, he had he had raped her off of a secluded um, uh, spur off of the highway in the late seventies, and she reported that crime, and it was investigated, and police took his word for that, um, and uh, and and that really let set him on a lethal trajectory, um, and her story had never been publicly told; uh, she had never discussed it, and so she really became kind of the moral. The moral heart of this um, of this story. So you you've also produced a documentary. Was that a new storytelling form for you? Yeah, early on, uh, the editor of the Oregonian, Therese Bottomley, had this idea that hey, why don't you team up with uh, Dave Killen, who is an accomplished um, uh, filmmaker and photographer on staff. And uh, he's doing amazing work, by the way, on the demonstrations. And so Dave and I teamed up early on with our colleague, Beth Nakamura, who's also on the protest duty. 
uh, both of them, by the way, having been struck uh, during the course and, and injured um, during the course of, of their reporting on the demonstrations. But we were sort of a team on the Ghosts of Highway 20. And, um, you know, Therese really wanted a very strong visual component. And so we worked together from the very start, and, and that really informed uh, the way the, the, the project looks and feels. And we had so much rich material that uh, we turned it into essentially uh, episodes that are about 30 minutes in length. <laughs> what, is that, what does that visual component do for you that you can't do with the printed word? You know, it created a very immersive uh, experience for readers, um, and, and you're, we're still seeing uh, tremendous traffic to that uh, documentary on YouTube. Um, it it really resonated with readers in ways that I think the print product just just didn't. Uh, people really wanted to see and feel uh, what it was like on this uh, in this desolate part of Oregon, and the the images and the photojournalism and the documentary really allowed people to experience this in a way that the print just simply doesn't. And we're talking about crimes that unfolded a long time ago. Um, and so bringing that to life uh, was essential. Um, we're really kind of animating a story that took place a long time ago um, in a part of Oregon that people may drive on, but aren't super familiar with. Um, and so it was really incumbent on us to 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 infuse that with with life and vitality and and the photojournalism really allowed us to do that. Well, Noel, it's a tremendous body of work. Thank you so much for sharing some of it with us today. Please be safe and please keep us informed. She's Noel Crombie with the Oregonian. That's all the time we have this week for Story in the Public Square. If you want to know more, you can find us at PellCenter.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us next time for more story in the public square.